Today's webinar is entitled The COVID-19 Pivot, Optimizing Care of the Elderly and Long-Term Care Residents During the Pandemic. This topic has been on the minds of many of our colleagues and has been subject to a lot of recent media attention. More than half of the 2,000 deaths in Canada related to COVID-19 have come in long-term care homes. These settings have been hit hard by this pandemic, particularly in the provinces of Quebec and Ontario. As of yesterday, 80 facilities in Quebec and 128 in Ontario are currently dealing with active COVID-19 outbreaks. And due to staffing shortages, members of the Canadian military forces have been called in to help deal with this crisis. So what is it about elderly patients living in long-term care settings that make them more vulnerable during a pandemic? Can infection prevention and control policies be implemented to prevent outbreaks and minimize spread? And what physical and mental impacts do these outbreaks have on both patients and staff in long-term care? To answer these questions and others, it's my pleasure to introduce the three speakers joining me today. We have Dr. Andrea Moser, a family physician at Baycrest Geriatric Health Sciences in Toronto, Ontario. Dr. Elise Levinoff, a staff geriatrician and general internist at the Jewish General Hospital and a consultant at the Jewish Elder Care Center, both of which are affiliated with the Integrated University Health and Social Services Center West in Montreal, Quebec. And finally, Dr. Michael Schwant, a public health physician and medical officer at Vancouver Coastal Health. I wanna welcome all three of you and thank you so much for participating. As is standard with these webinars, our conflict of interest information will now be posted. Brian, thanks so much for posting this slide. Michael, can we start with you? Can you say a quick hello and just review your conflicts of interest, please? Absolutely, thanks for the introduction, Alan. And I am a board member of Basics for Health, which is a local not-for-profit here uh, in Vancouver, promoting the social determinants of health uh, in, uh, in communities uh, in the Lower Mainland. And also, I currently hold a, a research uh, grant as a team member with a, uh, a team looking at uh, overdose prevention within the Vancouver area. Excellent. Elise, can you do the same? Yeah, so I... Uh... I'm, I have no conflicts of interest other than I receive a small salary support for some research that I do with the Department of Medicine at my hospital. Excellent. And last but not least, Andrea. Hi. So I'm actually a staff at Baycrest Health Sciences in the role of Associate Medical Director and the Chief Medical Information Officer. And in terms of disclosures, I have been co-lead of the long-term care um, antibiotics wisely in long-term care, which is a initiative of choosing wisely Canada and health Canada. And I've received a small stipend for that work. Excellent. So I'll now review my conflicts of interest. So you can see my listed affiliations on the screen. I do work for the CFPC as a physician advisor, like I mentioned, I also get remunerated for other leadership roles that are listed on this slide. I want to make a, a point to say that the organizations listed here are all not for profit and I have no affiliation and receive no funding from the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, so just a few housekeeping issues before we get into this. Our audience today is joining our live webinar from either Facebook or YouTube. In both platforms, you will be able to participate by asking our panel questions. We invite clinicians to submit questions at any time throughout the webinar. If you're using YouTube, please submit your questions in the chat window. You will need to be logged into your own Google or YouTube account to do this. If you cannot see the chat window, you may be in full screen mode. For Facebook users, you must be logged into your Facebook account to submit questions. The chat stream will either appear to the side of the video or below the video, depending on the device you're using. Of the College of Family Physicians of Canada, this is eligible for one main pro, pro plus credit and Brian's put up that slide. In order to claim that credit, you'll need to complete a short registration form or survey. The link will be posted in the chat or comments window at the end of the webinar, and we ask you to complete that by the end of, sun of the day, Sunday, April 26th, and you have until midnight to get those in. A recording of this webinar will be made available at cfpc.ca slash clinical webinars, or you can just find it on the CFP CFPC website. The next webinar that we have planned, actually before I get to that, sorry, um, while we're on this slide, family physicians have been sharing their experiences, ideas, and questions 
about managing and coping during the COVID-19 pandemic on a fantastic online forum called My Groups. It's part of the member interest group section of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. My Groups is a CFPC member only secured online discussion forum with over 4,000 members. We'll post how you can join My Groups on the chat session and at the end of the webinar. Um, Brian, can you just go back to the mitigating conflict of interest slide? I passed that pass by, thanks. So the other thing to mention before we start is that this program has not received financial or in-kind support. The questions posed in today's webinar were developed by staff from the CFPC and recommendations are based on uh, the evolving evidence and situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, that's great. So um, before we dive into uh, today's discussion, let's review uh, the learning objectives. Perfect. So after this webinar presentation, uh, participants will be able to identify factors that make elderly patients in long-term care settings more vulnerable to infections with COVID-19. We'll describe infection prevention and control protocols designed for long-term care homes to prevent an outbreak and minimize the spread of infection. We'll explore the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health and well-being of elderly residents, physicians, and staff associated with long-term care homes and will recognize the importance of advanced care planning and goals of care discussions to guide treatment decisions among frail elderly patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. And with that, I'm gonna ask my first question to my Department of Family Medicine colleague, Dr. Andrea Moser. Andrea, what are some of the unique challenges in long-term care homes that make elderly patients more vulnerable, You know, specifically more vulnerable than those who don't live in long-term care? with regards to infections with COVID-19. Sure, great, and thanks for having me. And it's great to see everybody from across the country on this important topic. Um, I think when you work in long-term care, you know who we care for in long-term care. So if you look at the Kai Hai um, website and other um, areas where they post statistics around and demographics around long-term care, we have residents who are quite frail who often have comorbid um, cognitive issues and dementia. So cognitive issues up to 90%, dementia at least 60% of those of our residents we care for in long-term care. And along with that, an average age of around 85 years. Um, those residents also have multiple comorbidities, an average of nine or more regular medications, often comorbidities that also place them at risk for complications from COVID, such as cardiorespiratory illnesses, diabetes, chronic neurological conditions, chronic kidney disease, amongst others. Um, they also have extensive assist needed with um, activities of daily living. So then when we look at what we're seeing with COVID, we're realizing that people who have more complex um, chronic illnesses, more dependency for care, increased age, increased frailty, um, are at increased risk of adverse outcomes and a higher mortality rate from long-term care. When we look in Canada of our COVID deaths from what I have recently um, kept up to speed with, about 50% of those people are estimated to be people who are living in congregate living, particularly long-term care homes. So it's the population that we're caring for, a very at-risk population, and then the environment of our long-term care homes as well. We often have um, um, part-time staff who are working in more than one facility, so are they, is there a risk of that um, being spread um, from facility to facility? We know our medical staff often are working in a primary care office as well as coming into long-term care. So that, that risk of um, crossing over sectors is also an issue. And we also have residents who may be moving about going um, to hospital, for example, residents on dialysis are having to go back and forth to acute care three times a week. Um, sometimes more. And then the actual environment of the long-term care home itself, and that varies greatly over our, 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 our country um, and greatly across the world. So there are some homes where there are um, larger homes, newer homes, um, larger rooms, more space. There are others where we still have a lot of congregate living within rooms. So people um, living two, three, sometimes even still four people in a room sharing um, personal spaces such as washrooms. So that makes it very hard to um, contain um, a, 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 an outbreak of, of, of an illness like we're seeing with, with COVID. So um, hopefully that gets us started on, on, on this question. No, that's great. great. It sounds, sounds like there's a lot of challenges uh, in these long-term care homes. Um, the next question is for Dr. Levinoff. Um, 
Elise, can you review the typical and atypical symptoms of COVID-19 that may present in the elderly population? Yes. Um, so, I mean, really what, what a lot of the expectation was that, was that we would see patients who would have often fever, shortness of breath, cough, runny nose, uh, difficulty breathing, dyspnea. Um, some, some patients were showing atypical symptoms of diarrhea. Um, but what we're actually seeing in a lot of the elderly uh, population, particularly in the nursing home and even in the acute care facility is that they're coming in with confusion and on a baseline history of cognitive impairment, uh, at some points dementia, um, the confusion is worse. Uh, a lot of the elderly patients tend to manifest the clinical illness of COVID-19 as falls. Um, and a lot of them are severely malnourished with uh, hypovolemia as well. Okay, so you know, it sounds like there's there's so many symptoms that you know we really have to keep our eye on uh, presentations and be very suspicious of COVID in this population. Um, Michael, we're going to turn to you now uh, with a question that uh, I think a lot of people would love to know the answer to. How do you actually define an institutional outbreak? You know, we've heard things like, is it one infected patient? Is it transmission from staff to patients? Could you shed some light on this for us, please? Absolutely. In the British Columbia and uh, understanding the Ontario, newest Ontario guidance, we're using the threshold of only one staff or one resident diagnosed, which seems like a low threshold to, to meet. Uh, but we do think that's appropriate given how fast these outbreaks can spread and the opportunity for early intervention. Some exceptions to that have been when we've had a staff who's been diagnosed and we're able to confirm that the only work that they've conducted at the facility has been with appropriate PPE and there has not been a risk for ongoing transmission. But if there's any uh, discussion of a breach in that or any uh, discontinuity in the use of the personal protective equipment, uh, we would describe even a single staff or uh, resident exposure within the facility as, a, as, a, as an outbreak. There's been some discussion about the documentation of transmission within the facility, but in many cases, especially with the, uh, the vague and varied declaration of symptoms in this population, we found that it can take too long to find the second case that we might need to reach that definition and really uh, recommend acting at the level of a single, a single case. And while we're on the topic, and thanks so much for clarifying that for the audience, what are the criteria to determine when you can officially declare an outbreak being over? Okay, and that's, uh, I think, a, a moving picture that we'll be learning about over the coming weeks and months as all of these outbreaks are relatively new. We've only had the privilege of declaring a small, uh, a small few or even looking at declaring a small few over in the jurisdiction I work in, Vancouver Coastal Health. And right now we're still using the, using the criteria of two full incubation periods, uh, 28 days since the onset of the first case, which can seem like a long time. I think that the, this defined incubation period probably over time will prove to be at the longer end, the more inclusive end of, uh, of incubations. But for out of a total abundance of caution, that's the criteria that we've been using is 28 days since the last, uh, since the last new case, which is a, a conceptual threshold used for other uh, types of outbreaks, whether that's influenza or other infections, uh, and overall, that's the I think erring on that side of caution is the is the way to go. Recognizing some of the the impositions that might place on a facility, which we'll probably discuss further. Okay, that's great. Well, we're going to continue along the outbreak uh, subject, and uh, the next question is for Andrea. So, Andrea, and we've 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 created a slide for this question. So so because there's a lot of info, and we're going to ask you to comment on it. Uh, but before Brian brings it up, the question is: What infection prevention and control protocols could be applied to long-term care and residential homes to prevent a COVID-19 or other outbreak, and that could help minimize the spread of infection if an outbreak occurs? And Brian, if you want to bring up that slide, Andrea can answer the question, and and the audience can take a look. I know it's a bit of a We lost. Andrea, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, this is again something we're learning about. Um, if we had to speak to this three months ago, it would be much different than what we're speaking to now. And, and maybe two weeks from now, we're going to change again. But I think we're learning from other jurisdictions and, um, and learning from our own experiences as well. So, um, how do we make sure that we're identifying staff who may be 
um, inadvertently vectors of this um, illness. So what are we doing to screen staff? What are those questions that um, we're asking staff when they come in? How are we really supporting our staff to say, if you're sick, don't come to work? So not penalizing um, staff when they feel they can't come into work. How are we enabling access to testing um, so that we can um, you know, make sure we also are maintaining a workforce in long-term care? I think that's one of the big challenges as we could become more robust with um, with staff surveillance, um, we run the risk, um, and we're seeing that live, I think, in homes that, that have outbreaks of how do you maintain the staff um, at the bedside as well. So really encouraging staff to stay home, but trying to have a testing mechanism in place so people who are negative um, can come back to the workforce. Um, we also are looking at how do we um, have people who are working in multiple sites, um, be able to identify one site to work in. And that's something that really needs a lot of support from multiple layers, not just the individual long-term care homes. So people who are working three part-time shifts in order to pay their bills, they need to be offered a full-time shift somewhere. So how are we supporting that and how are we stepping up a, as a sector and, and a healthcare system to support that? Um, a big thing around, around PPE, we're hearing a lot about um, people have, you know, the tick sheets on infection control and what do you need to do? but actually doing it and live and trialing it. There's some great videos coming out now about how to do this. They're short, short videos, but have people watch it. One of the things we're trying to do is a buddy system for donning and doffing. So if I'm actually going into a room where it's positive, do I have somebody watching me to make sure I'm putting that on correctly and taking it off? We're doing, you know, all our management and our, our team walking around and, and gentle reminders and nudges to people. If, they, if we don't think they're using the PPE properly, that reminder of this is really important we know wearing a mask may be uncomfortable but what you're doing is really important for the residents you're caring for as well as for yourself and your family members so um, that that support where we're also the temperature checks or something but again we're hearing that some homes can't get um, um, thermometers so again everything has to be done in, in the best way that you possibly can and I think the other piece is is long-term care we often think of ourselves as isolated islands and this is a time I've worked in long-term care for over 25 years and we're we're now part of the system. I now have in internets reaching out to me. We have our hospital partners saying, if you're having trouble with PPE and you, you, you need assistance, call us and we'll help us. So I think if that hasn't happened to you in your jurisdiction, reach out to your to the people who you usually reach out to and have a conversation. Um, people really want to help. We've seen mobilization of community testing centers coming into long-term care homes in Ontario. So I think this is a real opportunity for um, the whole system to work together and support um, our residents and our staff. Um, and then clustering care. So if you do have um, residents um, who are positive, either trying to cohort onto a unit, depending on your facility and what you're able to plan for, but also on a unit itself, if there's two residents, then have those as assigned staffing, not having to go um, to, uh, to other people. Um, on the unit and try to restrict that as much as possible. Um, for our, our residents we, we care for, it's a real struggle. Um, I, I care for residents who have um, advanced dementia with behavioral issues and wandering. And we know the best management for that is non-pharmacologic and behavioral strategies. And how do we do that in the context of COVID? And, and, and there's some great guidance coming out from um, geriatric psychiatry colleagues, regional geriatric programs around how to really make sure, let's not throw away best practice with this, let's try to optimize that. But then also we have to recognize we have to keep everybody safe, residents and other residents. So um, it becomes uh, an ethical and, and, cha and challenging issue for us as clinicians um, on, on managing this. But still, and, and, and the other piece that we're starting to see is how do we use virtual care and digital health? So we're seeing all sorts of wonderful things on um, the internet around um, families, you know, waving through windows or signs being posted or um, e-visits with loved ones. So using an iPad, using FaceTime, using virtual care. Residents with a dementia may not be able to self-initiate that and may not have those devices, but how do we bring that to them and how do we support that visit with the, with the family and that connection with the family uh, members? And then I think we're also, um, one of the things that I found with my residents who are, who are um, capable and really aware of what's going on, trying to um, restrict their screen time to um, the news. So every time I walk in the room and the news are on, say, you know, what else could we be watching? Let's just limit how often much as we're doing for ourselves. Um, and, 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 and then also, I think the fact that this is, this is a national response 
This isn't just for telling long-term care residents to stay in their rooms. We're asking everybody to stay in their rooms and in their homes. So I, I, I've had some residents where they had um, celebrated Passover Seder with their entire family on Zoom. And last year, they actually didn't go out to Passover Seder because it was too difficult for them. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, you know, enabling that that technology. Um, and then also with our, with our visitors and our families, I think, again, because what we're seeing in the community is this really closing down of everything, there's really that understanding and appreciation of we're doing this um, because it's the safest way to manage um, um, your your resident um, that's in our care. Um, So I think that's, I could go on probably for 10 hours on this slide. So I think I'll probably cut it there and and let you get to the next question. No, that's perfect. Um, Elise, any other comments uh, just from from that slide that was just up that uh, you want to mention before I, I get back to Michael? Well, uh, yeah, thank you. You can hear me? It's okay? Yeah. Okay, I, I do want to say that there was a point brought up that perhaps moving residents from uh, a hot area, potentially, oh, sorry, a potentially cold area to a potentially hot area is obviously the right thing to do. But we also have to remember that this is, these are the residents' homes. And so it's a matter of moving it's a it's really a matter of moving the contents all the all, everything and it's a huge logistical difficulty a conundrum when one resident is particularly in a semi autonomous residence not necessarily just a long term care facility but it's it's quite difficult to actually physically move a resident from one area of a of a residence to another um not only for the logistic issues, but also the the wards or the units are designed to meet different care needs of different residents, right? So if a patient with uh, behavioral uh, behavioral manifestations of dementia, as Andrea mentioned, is positive, and you move that particular resident to another area, the care is, the care needs are completely different. And so we always have to keep it in mind that those are particular challenges that could occur. Um, and I think at that point, what needs to happen is instead of moving the resident to a different level or a different room or a different floor, it, it might be more worthwhile to bring the appropriate healthcare professionals to that resident to be able to help the resident and 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 keep things under containment. Okay, that's great. Um, so we've we've just spent a few minutes talking about what can be done to prevent an outbreak or even when, when sort of do things that you can prevent spread of infection. I'm gonna to go to Michael now. I'm gonna ask, once an outbreak actually occurs, are there specific you know, actions that need to be implemented within an institution, like almost immediately to try to contain and manage that outbreak? Absolutely. I think a couple of the things on a facility-wide basis that we'd recommend are moving to a setting where there's much less congregation. So this might mean canceling or restricting social activities, having in-room dining if, uh, only if possible so that there's not congregation around uh, around uh, food. Um, and then these other facility-wide approaches to trying to minimize the that social contact and physical contact between the residents. And then when public health has been involved with uh, outbreak management, really what we try to support is really meticulous uh, contact finding and management of those contacts. So for every resident or staff who's infected, they'll have a, a web of people who's been in contact with them, whether that's through the delivery of care, of course, and then also uh, the staff to staff contacts through a social setting. So that could be as simple as a lunchroom, um, rides to and from work and so forth. And we've cast an extremely broad net with those contacts. We found that it actually requires very little contact to have a transmission event. We've had situations where someone swears they only had 10 minutes of conversation with somebody, a situation where somebody's only contact was with the patient was a uh, was a stocking change, and then that ends up being a, a transmission event. So we found that this, a, a, the uh, close contact definition needs to be quite inclusive, and people who have had that close contact with a lab-defined case need to be uh, either isolated under appropriate precautions, if that's a resident, or uh, excluded from work, unfortunately, if that's a staff person. And that has impacts that we, we've started to discuss and could talk a little bit more about. As well as that, the facilities need to take a very proactive approach to um, to symptom monitoring and testing for both residents and for staff. As we've already uh, heard, the symptom the symptomatic presentations in this population can be um, can be quite mild, can be quite varied as well. Uh, in many cases, we've had through our through our daily symptom screens, nurses saying asking if they should test someone, saying they just didn't look themselves. So they mentioned having a runny nose or being a bit more tired 
we've had people who had as their only symptom, otherwise quote asymptomatic people having a having a fall, who have we've tested having that very low threshold, who have ended up being uh, being cases. So there's uh, uh, there's uh, a number of asymptomatic cases and a number of uh, people with uh, quote asympt asymptomatic uh, presentation, so atypical presentations that we uh, that we want to test. So I do remind all of the staff that are involved in these facilities and the medical leadership that we work with to test early and to uh, to test broadly uh, when in the in the context of an outbreak because they can often be people with very mild symptoms sitting up in bed who swear they can't believe that they're infected who in the meantime could be transmissible. That's excellent. Um, and just to follow up on some of the questions with regards to outbreaks, um, you, you mentioned testing. Um, is, can you shed some light on whether we should be testing asymptomatic patients and or staff who are working or living uh, sort of in an institution that, that is on outbreak? Like what do we do about the asymptomatic uh, people? Yeah, great question that we're, that we're asked often. And generally speaking, the advice has continued to be that we're giving to not test people in the absence of symptoms. However, working with uh, your public health department, whether that's a regional health authority in BC or a public health unit in Ontario or other jurisdictions, the uh, option to test close contacts of known cases, even in the absence of symptoms, is I think important to, uh, to pursue in the long-term care setting. Uh, recently, we had an outbreak uh, in Vancouver, and this is a case where a staff member had some exposure while symptomatic, and then we look back at their pre-symptomatic exposure throughout the, the time that they'd spent in the two days before, they had symptoms, they'd worked throughout the facility. And we chose to actually test all of the residents that they had contact with, regardless of symptoms, knowing that in many cases, people might not be able to uh, declare symptoms, people might, might not recognize them, and they can even be asymptomatic carriage. So in, in that testing, we actually ended up identifying three people who had no symptoms at all, who uh, in one case went on to become symptomatic, and in two cases had stayed asymptomatic, who wouldn't have been found otherwise, if not for doing that asymptomatic screen. So on a general population basis, while we're still not recommending asymptomatic testing, I think in the context of an investigating an outbreak, specifically in the long-term care uh, setting, I think that uh, asymptomatic testing of close contacts of a case is, a, is something to pursue with public health, uh, especially in rapidly growing outbreaks. Well, that's great. And I think going back to the question that Elise answered earlier, you know, there are so many typical and atypical symptoms that I think those of us that are working with elderly patients, I think if our if our gut tells us that maybe they're they're coming down with symptoms, they, they can go from asymptomatic to symptomatic very quickly. But your point about uh, being, uh, you know, having our radar, checking our radars very quickly, determining who to test is very important. So, so you know, we've covered a lot about preventing outbreaks, what happens during outbreaks. There's a term uh, that we hear often associated with long-term care called the medical director or the director of care. And Andrea, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what is that person's role? Who usually fills that role? And especially during a pandemic like this, you know, what do we look to them for in terms of guidance? Sure. So two different people, two very different people, um, and hopefully are working um, arm in arm and linked. So uh, director of care is, or director of nursing is the, nur the um, sort of a lead nurse in the facility as well administratively. So is in charge of what's happening with the nursing team, um, hiring and um, implementing best practices. Usually the director of care is that point person for linking with the public health department um, and helping to ensure that all of the training and supports are in place for the um, staff in the nursing home. The medical director in Ontario, it's a legislated position and that's variable. I know across um, the, the country, um, it's also legislated um, south of the border in the US. And the medical director is really your sort of mini chief of staff in your nursing home. And it's a very important um, position. And I think it is the um, un, unappreciated workforce in long-term care that um, your medical director can provide uh, medical leadership around issues like outbreak management, helping to sift through some of the directives, helping to bring um, medical information to the nursing home um, that you're, you're hearing from webinars and from our colleges and from our physician organizations. So making those linkages. Oftentimes in a smaller community, the medical director also is a physician in the community who has um, interaction um, with the acute care hospitals and the primary care community practice 
practices. So what are those linkages and how are we all working together? One of the things we're learning, we, we know in Ontario, we have about 20% of our nursing homes, there's about 700 and 622 nursing homes, I believe, who are actually in a declared outbreak right now. But those homes who aren't in outbreak, you're in a, in a preparedness and prevention mode. So what are you doing? Are we sitting and waiting and thinking, okay, I'm waiting for the call. Do I have a positive resident or not? Or are we doing something more proactively? And I think this is really a role for the medical director to, to step up and, and, and really show um, how you can be part of that leadership team in the home and really support not only the medical staff that are coming in, but the entire leadership team and working with the director of care, um, with your public health department. So making sure that, again, are we doing what we can with PPE? Do we know what our um, availability of PPE is? Do we know who our contacts are in public health? All those people are often changing. Have we had a new, um, you know, new leadership in the nursing home? Do we all know who each other is and, and are we connected? How are we actually looking at our medical staff? We know um, many different directions are coming in at different points, medical staff may become sick, maybe on isolation, may have to choose which practice um, to be in person at and which one to provide virtual care to. So how are we communicating that with the team? How are we preparing for that? How are we making sure that our electronic records are accessible to a physician who may have to provide support from home rather than coming into the home? Um, so all those pieces are critical pieces are around um, the role of the medical director. Um, the other one we're hearing more and more about is medication management within the home. So how are we preparing? Do we have emergency drugs on, on standby in the home? Are they appropriate for COVID? If not, how are we updating those lists? And we've done some work around um, curating what are some of the medications you may need to have on hand for residents who um, have COVID and where goals of care are to um, focus on comfort measures in, in, in the context of this. And then the other one, which is really, um, really quite creative that people are doing is this is a time to look at optimization of medication. So um, we often don't look at the MAR and see that we've actually ordered medications three times a day, which are at 8.30 and 12.30 and five. And then they're also getting meds at HS. And then maybe there's something else that's popped up at 10 a.m. So now the nurse is going into that room six times a day when maybe they only need to be going in twice a day for those med administrations. So how do we decrease that sort of pill burden of our residents? How do we uh, get rid of medications? Maybe that we've always thought, you know, I'm not sure about the statin for this resident. And, and actually now I think is the time that if I can stop a medication that doesn't have a really strong indication and isn't in line with the person's goals of care, this is probably the time to do it. So I think physicians, we really have a role to step up right now. And particularly those of us who are, um, you know, really, in that that fortunate position to be um, a medical director how can we really um you know be present um engage with the home um help them with um questions they may have and really help in terms of making sure that we're ready um if and when um COVID comes into your nursing home no that's great andrea and and your last point about the medical medication reviews i mean i think we all know how important medication reviews are in general but just your point about, you know, are there certain meds they don't need right now? Can we change the dosing frequency to, to minimize those visits, especially for patients that are infected with COVID? I think is, is a fantastic point that, uh, that we can all take away. And um, I, can I just add yeah, quickly, I think also in preparing for, we may be working with staff shortages. So if people are having COVID residents in their home and um, you know, so again, how are we respecting the work of the nursing staff and how are we really working with them to make sure that they're working to their best potential and not doing things that might be taking away from other very important um, patient care? No, absolutely. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit now. Uh, this question is for Elise. So um, some long-term care and other residential homes are restricting access to communal areas. And this can be quite isolating for patients who remain in their rooms for several days on end. And, um, and obviously, as we mentioned earlier, some long-term care homes are restricting outside visitors. So when we think about quality of life and mental well-being, can you talk about some of the challenges that are encountered, as well as some strategies that we can implement to prevent isolation for patients uh, during a pandemic. Yeah, so it is it is the case now in Quebec that um, that uh, families are being restricted uh, from coming into long term care homes as well as semi autonomous residences. Um, it was in an effort to prevent the spread of asymptomatic. Uh, 
uh, asymptomatic patients or asymptomatic people. Um, it does cause a, a lot of concern uh, because a lot of these patients need assistance for feeding, assistance for uh, mobility, assistance for changing um, you know, undergarments, diapers, um, even getting dressed in the morning, some of them need significant assistance. Uh, in terms of social isolation, yes, we, we always uh, preach that social isolation, isolation is important for reorienting patients with cognitive impairment, um, better for quality of life of uh, certain patients. Uh, so yes, th those, are, those are a lot of challenges that have been encountered. Uh, the other thing too is that um, a lot of these long-term, a lot of long-term care facilities were developed uh, to promote social isolation. So uh, elderly individuals were encouraged to eat uh, as a group in uh, in communal uh, dining halls, which are now no longer being used because there's concern that in close quarters there's a rapid spread of uh, disease, uh, spread of infection. So there are some challenges there. Um, obviously, the extra care is absolutely necessary from professional healthcare uh, individuals. Um, I think, uh, you know, the the iPad project that uh, is is slowly being introduced to have residents call their families, um, but they need assistance for that as well. I mean, you need to make sure that they have their hearing aids in so that they can hear that they're wearing glasses so that they can see the the iPad. Um, but I think even you know those sorts of those sorts of strategies can help prevent social isolation. And I think uh, as Andrea mentioned, to to take away the medical responsibilities of some of the uh, auxiliary nurses and the orderlies and and re uh, redefine their roles as more as, uh, caregivers rather than as healthcare providers. So instead of dispensing Lipitor, uh, take out the iPad and, and call the family. So so reallocate the time uh, for the appropriate resources that are needed uh, with careful reconsideration clinically of what's necessary. That's great. And uh, Andrea, should we be uh, taking our relatives home from long-term care <laughs> because we're scared that uh, they can't get what they need and during a, a COVID-19 outbreak? Ah, you gave me the tough question. <laughs> um, no, this is a really loaded question. And um, again, going back to what I talked about earlier is residents are living in long-term care for very valid reasons. And long-term care admission happens after an exhaustion of all other supports that can be put in place in the community. And I think it's really important um, to, to reiterate that. And one of the challenges, as we've heard, is if you remove or bring a loved one home or family member home from long-term care, um, what's the time frame on that? And when can a person come back to long-term care? Um, so if a long-term care home is on an outbreak um, and the person left when there wasn't an outbreak, then how, did, how does that person come back in? And what isolation procedures have to be put in place for that? But I think the bigger question is, we know in the community, what are the strains on our home care resources? How um, somebody who's been living in long-term care, who now would their primary care provider be in the community if they're living in a nursing home with um, uh, you know, an organized medical staff model, such as what I work with in um, Toronto? How do you organize um, you know, the home care supports and all that's needed? How do you organize the physical space so that it's safe um, for residents? So you may be um, removing from one identified risk with potential COVID, but what other risks are you potentially um, introducing? Um, it's a very, very challenging question. And I'm going to have to go because there's a overhead that's probably interrupting anybody. So I'll get you to go on to your next question, Alan. Okay, no problem. No problem. Thanks so much. Um, Michael, we're going to we're going to turn back to you. Um, you know, during a pandemic, just in general, not necessarily when homes are on outbreak, but just during a pandemic like COVID-19, you know, what resources might be required to actually give assistance to long-term care homes? Can you list some of those for us? Definitely. I mean, the three main categories that we hear about from the long-term care is both uh, in outbreaks and also just preparing for that, that potential uh, impact is uh, around, around staffing, around uh, personal protective equipment, and also around testing. I think that all of the facilities right now, whether and hopefully before the onset of an outbreak, 
are doing the continuity planning in terms of their staffing to be able to think of how they might operate with some of their staff off of work due to illness or due to exposure to known cases and so forth because there can be a, a vicious cycle in which uh, if staff need, are working while, while they're sick uh, there can be more infection there's certainly more risk for breach of uh, protocols around infection prevention and control and then um, you might end up with even uh, even more staff shortages so i think planning ahead for that is very important and working with uh, whatever in whatever jurisdiction you are whether that's a, again a regional health authority or other to look for staff supports uh, from outside could be it could be an option depending on the the staffing model of the facility. In British Columbia, we've been able to get, in, uh, in cases of extreme need, we've been able to get health region staff to uh, to go into work into different facilities where they're not normally placed, uh, just to make sure those, those gaps don't exist. Around personal protective equipment, again, before the onset of an outbreak, having a sense for what it might be like with uh, outbreaks of different intensity, if say five people, 10 people, or 30 people were all on contact and droplet precautions at once, perhaps for two weeks, the burn rate, uh, as they say, for this equipment during an outbreak is you, we found to be much higher than facilities uh, expect. And, and, and fair enough, this is really a quite unprecedented uh, caution that we're taking around those, those precautions. So thinking ahead in that and always being two steps ahead, looking at not the next days, uh, but the next weeks or the next two weeks supply is very important. So that we're never looking at the, the bottom of the box, as it were, for gowns, masks or gloves. We should always I think staff always need to feel like it's they're using that when they need to for uh, for prevent reasons of prevention and not in a state of, of rationing of that equipment is the best possible scenario. Uh, we really want don't want that to restrict that uh, even unconscious restriction of use to come into play. But finally, testing, although there seems to be a uh, good capacity in most systems right now with the availability of tests and the uh, the lab capacity to get tests done. <coughs> one of the issues that we found is at the first instance of a case, we really want to have that a friction-free uh, approach to being able to test. So the facilities should, uh, ahead of time, know where they'll be sending a test, uh, certainly being able to have staff that can take an NP swab where necessary and quickly, uh, and having the a clear pathway for where the test is going to go ahead of time is very important so that we don't, again, have a situation where there's any delay in testing. Maybe somebody's had mild symptoms and it can wait a day. Again, we would say test on site and making sure that we have the, the avenues in place for, for those tests to, uh, to be processed is really important. So those are a few of the things that we've heard of and tried, tried to support as a public health program here. No, that's great. And, and I, I, would, I would recommend that for, for all long-term care and residential homes, know the stakeholders in your communities that are there to support you uh, know the protocols that have been put in place and 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 definitely reach out because you're you're not in this alone. So um, there's about 17 minutes left in this webinar. And at this point, we're going to move to some of the questions that the audience is feeding me. And there's quite a few of them. We're going to start with a question from Joyce. And Joyce's question was was similar to the ones that we wanted to ask anyway. So I'm gonna we're not gonna get to every part of her question, but it's 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 related to it. So the question has to do with how do you determine which, if a patient is infected with COVID-19 in long-term care, how do you determine if they should be hospitalized or not? Uh, how do you determine if they should be admitted to the ICU on a ventilator or not? And she specifically wanted to know, you know, how important are goals of care discussions and advanced care planning, I guess, beforehand or even at the time to make those decisions? Elise, maybe we'll start with you. Um, well, <laughs> There's never been a, a, as good a time to do this, but uh, I, I truly do feel that if we're doing this now, we've, we've done it too late. Um, a lot of times what we discuss with families when, when we discuss um, what the goals of care or what the levels, what we call the levels of intervention are gonna be, uh, is that we essentially approach the, the topic as what, what would the patient want for their quality of life? Uh, obviously, we take into account um, their, the cultural and ethical uh, challenges that might occur on account of discussing uh, discussing who should be admitted to a hospital and who should who should be uh, uh, intubated um, at, at the most extreme. And we do have um, we do have guidelines. Uh, the the uh, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, so nice uh, rapid guidelines. Uh, have been used. Um, we've been encouraged to use the frailty index. 
Um, so we use those sorts of uh, guidelines to guide our discussions with families. Uh, but I think it's really important to discuss, first of all, what 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 is the what is the overall goal of care, and explain to the families that the mortality risk is extremely high in elderly individuals who require uh, mechanical intubation or or ventilation, uh, and and to get an idea of what the family understands and what the patient understands as well in terms of the the long term outcomes both. Uh, for mortality and for morbidity. We know that in a non-pandemic situation, uh, the, the, uh, the chances of elderly individuals uh, who are intubated uh, of uh, actually making a full recovery in a pre-frail or even a frail status are, are not good. The outcomes are not good to begin with. And, and then we take a situation like a pandemic that particularly is involving a virus that can cause respiratory compromise and, and we know that it's a lot harder. Okay, thanks so much for that answer. Um, we're gonna go to a question now for Angela, from Angela. Uh, and again, this, the, the answer to this might depend on the local environment, but uh, Angela asks, what supports are available or are needed if long-term care homes are looking for extra family physicians or nurse practitioners to sort of volunteer uh, in, in these times of need. Uh, Michael, you wanna try that one to start? Yeah, absolutely, and it's, you know, that will be definitely, as you said, Alan, it will depend to some extent on the specific context. I know that in British Columbia, we've worked hard to scramble staff from different areas, some of which are seeing, uh, having less, uh, less care needs right now in different parts of the health system and been able to bring, for example, nursing staff into the long-term care setting to be able to support. In terms of, uh, in terms of physician support, being able to, uh, to get involved with a specific site or a specific network of sites, I think that would really be quite specific to, the, to that site. Uh, but I know that in many cases, the need is there and could be, could be well appreciated. Okay, no, that's fantastic. And, and yeah, I mean, obviously with all staffing needs, again, uh, and locally, look for the resources that you have in place. Uh, if you need staffing help, definitely reach out and ask for those. Okay, there's another question here from um, uh, from uh, Lisa. Uh, Lisa wants to know, um, and maybe Andrea, you could take this one on. Um, how does one address agitation or restlessness um, during an outbreak lockdown? So when, when you're dealing with patients with behavioral symptoms uh, who are used to getting out, doing those sort of things, who might have cognitive impairment, uh, how do we manage that during an, an outbreak situation or a pandemic situation? Yeah, I, I think this is a really critical question for us working in long-term care. We know that a lot of times when it's wandering, um, behaviors that's aimless and not causing harm. It's really about redirecting and about behavioral strategies, trying to identify people's unmet needs, um, trying to address other things that could be contributing um, uh, to this. One of the tools that I use that I think is absolutely um, beneficial, outbreak or no outbreak, is the pieces approach. So really understanding the unmet needs, what's driving that behavior and then try to do everything possible to optimize and to manage that. So from, is there pain? Is there constipation? Is there hunger? Is there thirst? We've heard, you know, that people with COVID may have, you know, hypernatremia and hydration issues. So are we, are they getting enough water, uh, fluid and, and food at the bedside if they're on isolation? Um, and, and are we optimizing everything possible for them? We all know that psychotropic medications have um, deleterious effects in our residents and particularly those with um, dementia and again depending on the severity of the symptoms that are being presented um, we may have to use medications uh, if all other um, avenues have been exhausted um, so if there's severe distressing behavior that's distressing or harmful to the resident or putting other people at imminent risk of harm then we may have to look at those strategies again this is an area where pulling on all your resources. So the geriatric psychiatry community is starting to, um, to, to chime in on this as well as our geriatric medicine colleagues. We're finding more um, people are offering help to long-term care as well. So again, don't be that island, really reach out and find out who's out there. There's more accessibility to virtual care right now. 
Um, so how can you reach out to that geriatric psychiatrist who may come to your home, you know, once every three months, depending on where you live, but are they now accessible by phone and can you have a conversation with them about your options and strategies? I think also don't forget the, the comment about hypoactive delirium and delirium in these residents. Yeah. So make sure that their pain is being managed, make sure their uh, medical issues are being managed and I think this really puts us in a very challenging time. Um, we know there's been a lot of directives about uh, minimizing visits to essential visits only and um, how are we doing that? How are we making sure that the residents in long-term care are getting access to primary care? Are we doing that through virtual care? Are we doing that with um, very limited in-person visits? Um, and, and, and we can't lose, lose track of that. These are people who are complex frail, have cognitive impairment, and lots of comorbidities. So how are we optimizing um, their management um, and, and, and working with them? And, and we also have the other um, significant human piece of this is that family members who were coming and visiting regularly are not anymore in Ontario. Yeah. And so how do we maintain that physical contact with their family members and, and, and make sure that um, they have that connection and, and really, really important. And, and I think that's the human story of this. These are people, these are people with families. These are people who are terrified and afraid. And how are we um, meeting their needs um, in, in as humanistic way as possible? Um, how, how are we getting that to them? And I know one of the concerns is around, around food and hydration. So if you're no longer in the dining room, and you're now isolated to your room, do we have enough staff to be at that bedside and supporting them? So how are we optimizing? How are we bringing in possibly more staff around mealtime and making sure that people are getting that social engagement and that support? Um, so I, again, these are all conversations and all topics that are so critically important and we all could go on for, forever. But this one in particular, I think is, is really, really a, a tough one. And, and um, it goes against, we all talk about falls prevention and decreasing your strengths and decreasing antipsychotic use. Yeah. That's the push in long-term care for very good reasons. We're now in a pandemic and how, how does that change some of those management, but also what, what do we do to make sure that those options are the last option possible that we've exhausted everything else? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so there's, a, I'm, I'm trying to get through as many of these as I can and you guys are doing a fantastic job. Uh, but time is slowly running out. We have a question from Orida, and Michael, I'm going to give this one to you. It's, it's similar to a question we had planned for you, but uh, I like how she phrased it. So, so can you talk about some of the factors that may have contributed to the gaps in care that we've noticed in long-term care facilities during the COVID-19 outbreak? And specifically, do you think there'll be some sort of national or provincial strategy for addressing some of these concerns? Yeah, it's a great question. One of the things that we've observed early on in uh, British Columbia, and I understand the same is true of uh, Ontario, Quebec, and other contexts, is really the long-term care community, if you will, in terms of nursing or care aids, to some extent staffed uh, as a network. There's uh, a lot of uh, co-employment of uh, staff between different facilities, and so we found in many cases that once there was a staff person diagnosed, the contact tracing rapidly found that there were exposures across different facilities. And when that person then needs to be taken out of work, this creates a staff gap, not just at one facility, but at multiple. So again, there's this uh, cycle at work where we have uh, the potential transmission risk and also this degrades our uh, capacity to provide good care and infection prevention in facilities. So it's certainly uh, early on in Vancouver Coastal Health and British Columbia, and I understand in other places, there have been um, regulatory changes to keep staff working at one facility only. This is done with an understanding of the potential staffing challenges and balancing that with the need to prevent transmission uh, between the, between different facilities in that network. Uh, I would expect that some of those uh, some of these things will prove to be uh, specific to the current pandemic. And depending how things go, I would expect that some of these might be uh, might be seen as permanent moves that do have benefit to preventing that uh, interfacility transmission. I think that when staff uh, can work in one facility only. If they're diagnosed, it's a, a much more manageable piece for the facilities to manage that than when there's that uh, that cross-facility staffing. And, and Mike, a last question, and then I'm going to give you all a chance to give a closing statement. Ross wants to know on this topic, when, uh, when October, November comes and influenza season hits us, do you think that long-term care homes will be as vigilant as they are now with regards to all the rules put in place to prevent the spread of infection? Like, will, will this be the new normal? 
Yeah, it's a great question, and I think that it's it's a, a really good note that it's one thing to be very vigilant for respiratory and other symptoms in in March, April, and May uh, when they're much less common. Doing that in the midst of an influenza season will be will be very different. On one hand, perhaps with the with the usual cycle of things and people's knowledge of influenza season, the testing will be very broad around respiratory uh, symptoms. But again, as the whole panel has been noting, it'll be very important to also continue to look for those atypical symptoms, even just constitutional changes in that in the resident's function uh, and retesting for those other signs that could be more closely related to, to COVID as well. So hopefully, best case scenario, the, uh, the uh, influenza season will promote a, a revitalization of the kind of vigilance we're talking about right now. Uh, and I think that it will be very important to think of these influenza and COVID-19 as separate clinical entities that have some overlap and also some very important differences. Okay, excellent. All right, now you're each gonna get 30 seconds to leave us with a take home point. Elise, we'll start with you. Don't be afraid to test people, even if you think they're asymptomatic because what might be asymptomatic to a younger person might actually be symptomatic in an elderly individual, and I'm particularly speaking in terms of hypoactive delirium. Don't be afraid to reach out to special uh, healthcare professionals or specialists to give you guidance, as as Andrea mentioned, um, because uh, the the guidance is there and it's ready. Uh, don't forget our elderly, because they're now constituting a good proportion of the deaths that we're seeing in in COVID-19 patients and never be afraid to prepare better for uh, upcoming pandemics because there are ways to prevent this. Um, and, and you know, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's distressing in a way to see how, how a pandemic has unmasked just how vulnerable our elderly uh, patients are to us. Andrea. I think to the core of family medicine, I think um, be a family medicine champion in our nursing homes and for our elderly and for those of you who are also working in the community i saw a couple of posts about um, what are essential visits and remember that if 20 percent of our nursing homes in one province and i don't have the stats for all of our provinces but that's ontario are now in outbreak that means they're closed to new admissions so people who are sitting at home on a crisis wait list are still sitting at home so let's not lose track of those people in our communities who are needing um, some extra monitoring and care as well. And um, don't don't be afraid to step up and, and and take on a leadership role in this. We have a yeah. lot to we have a lot to share. We have a lot to um, give, um, and, and we have a, a, a lot that we can um, help to support our teams in long term care and the residents and families. More phone calls to families. More calls about advanced care planning. Really have those discussions and it's an iterative discussion so having a discussion now may be different than having a discussion if you have COVID in your facility but start to make those connections if you you don't have those already um, work with your colleagues and look out for each other so I think all of us are, are, are yeah. trying to stay on top of everything as much as possible we're all humans we all have families we all have lives outside of work and how do we balance that and make sure that we're doing that to the best of our ability when we're really, really exhausted and need to just turn our phone off for a day, try and find somebody who can cover you. And again, in the world of virtual care, it may not be the doctor down the street that you usually sign out to. There may be others that we can reach out to. And I think that's something that we really need to think of as a, as a medical community. How are we actually working together across those sectors, maybe even across geographic lines um, to, to support each other and, and support the most vulnerable that we're caring for in long-term care. Um, it's a marathon right now. It feels like a sprint to us, so, us all, so it's like a sprint marathon, but we have to be prepared. This is gonna be um, ongoing for a while. Yeah. And Michael? Well, absolutely. I think that being vigilant for, for cases and potential outbreaks is important, and also knowing that this is, as well as the risk that we're all aware of, it's also an opportunity to make a huge difference for so many different residents. In British Columbia, while we've had a few large outbreaks that are certainly have been uh, widely discussed, the large majority of them, 75 or 80 percent of our outbreaks have had five or fewer uh, residents. So in many cases, have had one resident or one staff person only. So I think that the facilities activating rapidly in terms of their outbreak management is absolutely crucial and really does make a difference. There should be no sense of inevitability or of, uh, of negativity around this as a, a real 
opportunity to, to prevent transmission. And family doctors who are engaged with facilities as, as the leaders really do set that tone. I think that people will be looking to be looking to physicians uh, on all of these issues and have a, have a great opportunity to, uh, to prevent major outbreaks. All right, so I wanna thank our three speakers, doctors Moser, Levinov and Schwann for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. And thanks to you, our live audience for tuning in. We hope you found this session helpful and informative. Once again, to claim Main Pro Plus credits, you can see the information on the slide and the, uh, the link to get those credits would be, it has been put in the chat box. Make sure that's done before Sunday evening at midnight. Also, if you're interested in joining our online discussion forum, my groups to sh share ideas about the pandemic, please email us at, at migs at cfpc.ca. Um, just a quick reminder to tune in to our next webinar. That will be on April 30th at noon. Um, it'll discuss the management. And then on May the 7th, the Patients Experienced Evidence Research or Peer Group, which is a joint collaboration of family physicians and interdisciplinary health professionals, will give a webinar reviewing evidence around multiple COVID-19 topics related to primary care. Just a quick thank you to the members of the CFPC Planning Committee who put this webinar series together and a special shout out to Brian, who's our IT expert behind the scenes. I wanna thank all of you again, including our, our members and associated healthcare colleagues for their tremendous efforts during these challenging times. Your time and dedication to the patients that you serve are very much appreciated. Thanks for joining us. Stay healthy, wash your hands frequently, and please encourage physical distancing and have a wonderful rest of your day.